Uh, Politico dropped a story today, uh, and I want to uh, check all three of you about this here. Uh, dropped a story today talking about how uh, some Democratic strategists are freaking out uh, with regards to this campaign uh, as it relates to, uh, you know, in terms of how the campaign should be operating and how uh, they uh, are not doing enough. The headline says Dems in uh, full blown uh, freak out over Biden. And so it's talking about a lot of the donor class uh, is talking about uh, a lot of the, um, uh, the the strategists, if you will. Uh, and and in reading the story, I, I thought it was interesting because they were talking about abortion and some things along those lines. And, and this is the thing that I, I say I've made perfectly clear here. Uh, Randy, I'll start with you. Uh, they cannot think that is going to be the dominant issue. Uh, you can go to my iPad. You can actually see the story. It's not going to be the dominant issue. To me, you have to have a multi-pronged strategy here. Uh, and, and I've made this perfectly clear when you talk about uh, African-Americans. Uh, and it's not just African-Americans. It's young voters, it's young white voters. It's obviously, it's Muslim voters. Uh, it's women voters. Uh, it's suburban voters. Uh, Democrats have to have, obviously, they have a much different coalition than Republicans. And what you also are seeing, you also are seeing how Republican legislatures uh, have been putting policies in place that are specifically uh, made it difficult to also register folks to vote. Uh, and so coupled with so what they want is they want a depressed turnout because they know high turnout, Democrats win. Depressed turnout, Republicans have a, a greater shot uh, at winning. And, and frankly, the campaign to me has to be far more aggressive. And what I keep articulating over and over and over again is that you have to understand the demographic shift among African-Americans. And that is voters who are 55 and under are less likely to identify as Democrats, which means you're going to have to be more aggressive in trying to go after them, spend more money in targeting them, and not just with ads, having community-based conversations. Uh, and frankly, I don't think the campaign has fully embraced that. And I think when you look at the polling numbers, you have softness there. And I keep and I've said uh, on this show, I've said to people directly, the couch is a real foe. Right. We, we, we are people who need to feel as if people see us, relate to our issues, and are talking with us about those issues. Um, and abortion will not be the only issue. Is it a big issue? Absolutely. But I don't think that is going to be the biggest issue amongst African Americans, amongst us. us. Um, and, and we have to, they have to be very pointed in our rights and how they've been taken. I mean, how, you know, the seeds that Trump planted before he left office, how our freedoms have been limited. You know, we care about that. We have always had to fight for freedom. And I don't see how anyone can deny that we've taken some steps backwards in the last several years due to policies and people that Trump put into office, particularly in these judge positions. So, yes, we need to have those conversations, directed conversations, intentional conversations that focus on what matters to us. And they need to talk about what they've done because some great things have, be, have been done. But there are more eligible black voters in this 2024 election, I think 7 percent more than in 2020. So all we have to do is ensure that we're not just eligible, but registered and get out there to vote. The, the thing here, again, when, when I'm talking about um, how you have to speak differently, Mustafa, it's because I've been out here on the ground. I've been to so many different cities. Uh, I've been, I mean, when I think back for the last five months, um, and I think back, I mean, my goodness, I've been to, obviously, Atlanta, Columbus, Ohio, been to Charlotte, uh, been to Miami, been to Houston, been to Dallas. Uh, and I could just go on and on and on. A lot of the places where I've been speaking, where I've been traveling, I know what I'm hearing. And if you're not properly communicating, and, and again, an ad is one thing, but it's also understanding how you message. Terrence Whitby, the pollster, has said, we're seeing significant misinformation from African American uh, that African Americans are seeing on Instagram and uh, to TikTok. In fact, I saw a story today talking about how the MAGA folks are really using TikTok to go after young people and spreading misinformation, which means 
if these are places where misinformation is being incubated, then you've got to have a counter story, which means you've got to know how to communicate that uh, in a certain way. And, and I just don't think that they're moving that quickly when we talk about that. You know, my dad used to have this quote. He said, don't tell me you love me. Show me you love me. So part of showing someone that you love them, showing that you're connected to them, showing that you hear them means that you also are able to highlight how and where you have made uh, investments inside of our communities. And, and they often don't do that very well. And the other part of it is that they also, for whatever reason, don't want to make the investments that are necessary in the individuals and the institutions that our folks trust. So I often wonder, are you serious about garnering more of the black vote if you are not willing to make those investments? And then at the last minute, they'll roll things out. So that dynamic has got to change if you're serious about winning. Now, if you're not, if you're just trying to, to show up, then that's a different story. But if you're serious about winning, then one, infrastructure, two, making those investments, three, making sure that people actually see how things are changing inside of their community, four, making sure that you have trusted voices that individuals believe and know will not give them anything but the truth. Now, if you're afraid of the truth, then maybe you shouldn't make those investments in individuals. But our people very well see through a mess. I promised my mama I wouldn't curse. So um, we've got an opportunity to actually do things correctly. And we have this long laundry list of where people have made mistakes in the past. And it's like, we forget very quickly. Randy talked earlier about the short memory uh, that many people in our country have. Well, the individuals who are running these campaigns evidently have that same condition because they continue to make the same mistakes time yep. and time again that we can fix. And, and when we talk about and see, when I talk about this idea, uh, Mustafa, then I'm going to go to Joe, this idea of, of, of how you target. Obviously, I mean, first of all, if black women are the number one Democratic voters and black men are the second highest Democratic voters, then that means it's how are resources being spent. So I sort of see this thing, there are two different layers here. I think of the first layer, you obviously have Biden-Harris campaign. Then you have the Democratic uh, Senate campaign uh, committee, Okay. Then you have the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, so DSCC, DCCC. Then you have the Democratic Governors Association. So that's sort of your first level. That's DNC as well, that's your party. Then below that, then you have your second line, which is actually more money than the top line. And that is Democracy Alliance. That is HRC. That is Sierra Club. That is Future Forward. Uh, that is American Priorities Pact. That means all of the environmental organizations. Mustafa, you sent me an article that was in the New York Times saying the Biden-Harris folks are not paying a lot of attention, that black people are looking at climate. So that means those environmental groups, what is your messaging? What is your spend on black-owned media? How, what, is your, what is your black uh, strategy? Uh, then you start going to your reproductive rights organizations, those PACs. How are they, you know, do they have a very specific black outreach? Do you have ads that are tailored to African-American voters? What black groups are you spending your money with? Then you talk about American Bridge, then you're talking about uh, Democracy Spring, and then you're talking about a free press action. There's another one, uh, I don't know, it's called uh, United Ford or United something, I'll I, I get the actual name. Uh, you got the Progressive Change Campaign Committee. Uh, I mean, I could go on and on and on, Advancement Project Pack. I can go on and on and on naming all of these groups. But what we are talking about here, again, uh, are billions of dollars being spent, Mustafa, and I don't actually see, and I know for a fact we've never heard from 98% of these people, you don't actually see a concerted, specific, organized, black, targeted campaign with the billions that are being spent for most of these groups. It's because they take our vote for granted. They make the assumption that we will just automatically show up, that our oppression will be so strong that we will eventually say, you know what, I I'm just going to go ahead and, and vote for X, which is a miss. They're, they're really missing the point because there are literally a whole bunch of folks who will not show up in this election if we don't have real communication and real connection that's there. Now, let's talk real quickly about those groups 
that you um, shared that list of individuals and, and organizations. I know probably 85% of them, roughly. Uh, if you take a look at their senior leadership, if you look at their decision-making bodies, often you don't see folks who look like us, especially folks who look like us who are making decisions about where dollars are going to go, whether those dollars are going out through forms of grants or contracts or whatever it is. So if, one, you have not yet evolved into the positioning of having a diversified leadership structure, then you have got to build some type of an advisory committee where you have individuals who can say, these are the folks who are out there who are actually doing the work. These are the media platforms that actually truly have the numbers that they say they do and not the phone numbers. And you should be making investments in that space. If you're not willing to do that, then you are not serious about one, supporting the needs that exist inside of the black community. Two, you're not serious about actually also trying to encourage folks to take a serious look at these candidates and be able to vote for the individual or individuals when you look at the fullness uh, of, the, of the set of folks who are part of, whether it's on the Democratic side, the independent side, or whatever it might be, who are gonna be able to help our communities. But it really comes back to one, making sure that you've got Leadership who looks like us, who comes from our sets of experiences, because just because you look like us don't mean that you care about what's happening in our community. Two, then making sure that you are prioritizing. Let me say that again, that you are prioritizing your spends and making sure that those dollars are actually going to the places and spaces and individuals who know how to reach our people, know how to honor our people, and know how to help to make sure that real change happens. And, and the thing, Joe, that... Um that I get and, and I hear people say, no, you know, we are paying attention. We understand the importance of black voters. But what I keep stressing is, but you better understand how the black voter is changing. You better understand how you must articulate, how, how you must message, how you must target, what it looks like. Uh, and what often happens in these campaigns from all of these PACs, all the rest of these groups, they push tons, billions of dollars on the television. Okay, let's blanket the airwaves. But the ground game is what matters. So then the question is, how are you investing in gr groups on the ground? I go back to 2016, I'll never forget, Marsha Fudge was quoted when she was then Congresswoman from Ohio. She was quoted in an article in the New York Times criticizing the Hillary Clinton campaign, making it perfectly clear, don't ask our people to volunteer, but you pay white folks to, run, to, to be on these campaigns. That's also part of the deal. How are you investing in ground game. All this sort of stuff matters. I talk to the folks with Black Voters Matter. Significant drop off in, of investment in them after the 2020 election. They make clear, you got to be organizing 365 days a year. You can't just do it uh, when there's a campaign. And I'm very clear, if any of these people are saying, oh, you know, we're just going to ramp up and, you know, after the Democratic convention in August, you're screwing yourself because you've now shortened your runway and you only got two months, September and October. That's pretty much it. They should have been going hard in January. But I say there should be a very aggressive mechanism in place this summer. Speaking to the issues, I think back to Freedom Summer. Of course, when you had your civil rights groups in the 60s, they understood that you just can't wait until after the, the convention. It's not, to me, that's just nonsensical. Yeah, it is. A cursed causes shall not come. And so, uh, God forbid they lose this thing. Um, uh, there will be some definite things that you can point to. Clearly, it's obvious that you have to, um, first of all, don't give up, uh, like Reverend Dr. Barber would say. Um, on people that are the, quote, unlikely voters. You know, every poll that you see is with likely voters. These are the people who we think are going to vote. But there's a whole lot of people, enough to make a difference in the election, that aren't considered, for whatever reason, amongst the likely voters. So how do you draw those people out? You certainly have to understand what's going on out there and so what's out on the street. And so you have to hire people that are there doing that work. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You will know firsthand what's changing, what's evolving, how black voters are getting different, the unique challenges that are presented with Donald Trump, uh, where sometimes people just don't even pay attention to what he says. You know, you know, some of them will remember him, you know, in a rap video 20 or 30 years ago and, and think about voting for him. Um, you have to understand those things. So 
You need to hire posters and understand black voters. Naturally, that's going to mean some black posters, uh, you know, black campaign workers, uh, you know, strategists that understand black people. That's going to obviously include some black folks, groups, uh, voting rights groups, uh, uh, you know, participation groups, environmental related groups. Remember, most of these environmental things that are happening uh, that are destroying communities are disproportionately affecting our community. If I am next door to something that has my son with asthma when he wasn't going to have it, I'm going to be more concerned about those issues. So we need to draw that out as much as possible. Listen to the folks that are on the street. Don't take anything for granted and play the long game related to that. Yep. This shouldn't be something that they need to ramp up. They should have been ramped up already. Yeah. Uh, uh, one of the pack I was talking about was unite the country. Uh, and, uh, you know, frankly, Randy, this is what I want to see from every single one of them. Again, American priorities, unite the pack, Emily's list, the environmental organizations, the reproductive organization. What is your black plan? What is your Black candidate campaign plan? What is your black outreach campaign? What is your black owned media campaign? How are you communicating? Uh, all of that because billions of dollars are going to be spent. And I'm going to go back to 2016. Uh, I remember, I mean, the Hillary Clinton campaign was being stingy, did not want to fund a whole bunch of stuff uh, uh, in August and September and with black folks. And then all of a sudden, I never forget, I got an email on a Thursday night. They were trying to, they were literally trying to spend 750 grand to a million dollars. And it was too late. Cause here's the other thing that, that people don't understand. There's only a certain, see, this is the piece that people don't understand, you know, in terms of whether you're talking about radio, television, or even digital. There's only a certain amount of inventory. So there's a certain amount. It's a certain, it's only a certain number of units. And so, what you're, going to see, what you're going to see is you're going to see folks who are going to be then booking that time. Well, and then the time gets more expensive the longer you wait. And so that's on the media side. But again, if you're not focused on the ground game, looking at the numbers, where do you need your most help? If I'm, if I'm, if I'm anybody on a, on a Democratic progressive pack or the campaign or the DNC or any of these people, I'm going... How did 50,000 fewer vote, folks vote in Milwaukee in 2022 compared to 2018? Mandela Barnes would be a United States senator. We would not have that MAGA fool Ron Johnson if that didn't happen. OK, so I'm sitting here going again, if I'm on the campaign side, I'm going. What happened to those 50,000? Where did they go? I'm looking at those precinct numbers. I'm trying to see where they are. Then what I'm saying is. If I want to win Wisconsin, I can't have a 50,000 vote drop off. I'm looking at Charlotte and I'm trying to see, OK, because Biden lost uh, North Carolina by about two and a half points in 2020. I'm sitting there going, OK, where did we lose last time? Where did Sherry Beasley lose by 100,000 some odd votes in 2022? How? Oh, is it, is it in rural North Carolina? I'm also then studying Georgia, which barely won, and go, hey, wait a minute. Warnock is not on the ballot in 2024. Ossoff, not on the ballot in 2024. So Georgia is totally different than it was in 2020. Okay, how am I doing this? Then when I'm sitting here doing, I'm, I'm looking at North Carolina, I'm going, hmm, I got crazy MAGA black dude Mark Robinson running on that side. I got Josh Stein running on this side. Okay, how am I coordinating with the Josh Stein campaign to say, hey, and Democratic Governors Association, or how are we spending resources to actually cover both? Oh, then I'm just looking at the same thing going, okay, we lost the House. All right, how are we targeting these congressional districts in New York that we lost in 2022 to flip those in 2024 to retake the House? And then what's the impact on black voters? That, to me, uh, should be happening because at the end of the day, you want to win. And the dumbest thing in the world to me is to be sitting on millions of dollars in cash after you lost an election because you said we couldn't afford it or, frankly, we wanted to be cheap and not spend the money. Randy. 
It, you're, you're speaking my language. The number one thing you do in sales is know your audience, because at the end of the day, we're selling. We have to sell ourselves. We have to sell our agenda. We have to sell our party. And it's sales. Know your audience. You can't even have a plan. The fact that they're presenting plans in the beginning of these campaigns. And I do think they are presenting the same plan that they've been doing over and over again because they're not paying attention, like you said, to their audience. Who, who, who are black people today? We're not monolithic, but how do we speak to all of them? Who's missing? Why aren't they showing up at the polls? Why do they feel disenfranchised? And how do we speak to them about what they want to hear and what they need to hear and what they care about? This is, uh, again, uh, when I look at certain things in this campaign, uh, Mustafa, when I look at language, when I hear, you know, democracy is in trouble. OK, that's a broad statement. <laughs> it's a broad statement. And, and I go back to what I was talking about. I mean, there's a story out of uh, the story the AP did that was amazing, that literally um, they passed a law in 2021 uh, that said that individuals who were being compensated could not help voters register. And the organization of Texas said, well, damn, how are we going to hire high school students and college students? See, what people don't understand is how diabolical they have been and how they've been passing these laws uh, in terms of because and it's, what it's done is it's had a chilling effect on third party groups because that's who they've been targeting. They've been targeting third party groups because that's who made the difference. Let me be clear, Mustafa, if, if it's not if it wasn't for third party groups, Warnock does not win in Georgia. He doesn't win in Georgia without 30 party groups. That's how he beat Herschel Walker, because they were on the ground aggressive. Uh, and because the Warnock campaign, frankly, you know, look, was not I mean by the mid September. They hadn't bought a single ad in any black newspaper in the state. They were asleep. They were taking things yeah. for granted. And so this is what I'm talking about. How? Because the, la the thing here. And I, I, for, if anybody who's listening or watching, I need you to understand what I'm about to say. Elections are won on the margins now. Yeah. Arizona, Georgia, it's 10, 12,000 votes. 2016, Trump wins the presidency because of 77,000 votes in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. 77,000 total votes in three states. If you go to 2020, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Georgia, Arizona. The number for Biden is about 220,000. Out of the million votes cast, this is going to be an election on the margins, meaning two, 300 here, 500 here, 600 here, 1,000 here. Mustafa, that's the election. That's the whole state. And so that's what I'm talking about here, how you must, and, and Republicans understand that, because for their deal is if I can decrease the voter turnout, then if I can shave off 400, 600, 1,000, 200, 800, that's the margins. It is. I mean, if we could get, every, if we could get people to understand that every vote matters. And if we treat it like that, then that means that we'll make the investments that are necessary because we know that this is a razor thin election that's going on. And that means that you've got to have the folks who are on the ground, the entities on the ground who know the folks, who can help to make sure that there's the proper messaging. Cultural competency is incredibly important uh, and, and making sure that the right messaging is there. But the message has to also be linked with real change that's happening and the additional change that will come if you, gar if you get my vote. And sometimes people fail for whatever reason to understand the continualness uh, of that process. So we're in a moment now where we know where uh, many of the, the states and the districts that are gonna play a critical role, and you've gotta make the investments there. But I also ask folks to not forget other individuals across the country and other locations that may not be in that handful of states um, that will help to move the election in one direction or the other. 
Because if we're truly going to say that that we love the individuals whom and we love these communities, then we've got to make that real. So yes, I understand the focus that's necessary uh, in those particular sets of states. But we also got to make sure that people know whether they're in Alaska or they're in Wyoming or wherever black folks might be in West Virginia, that you're not forgotten as well, um, as we make sure that we also have that focus uh, set of actions. Last point here, Joe, um, and, and that is um, when I when I say I go back to the micro targeting, if you will, I, I'm just going to use this show as an example. There are people out there. Oh, um, you don't have as many people watching you as CNN because I'm not trying to be CNN. I'm not trying to reach everybody. I'm not. I understand the audience. I understand who I'm serving. And the number of people, I was in Houston on Memorial Day weekend, the number of people who were there for the Coalition of Trade, uh, Black Unionists, they were all there, people all around the country who were talking about the show and what they love and issues that we cover. Now, going through the airports, same thing. People stopping me everywhere. Because it's called understanding how do you serve your audience? How do you super serve? Tom Jordan would always use this phrase. You must super serve your audience. And I think what often happens in politics, you'll have these strategists who go, oh, but if we want to reach a large swath of people, we could go over here. Okay, that's fine. Well, the people over there watching, how many actually understand the issues? How many are persuadables? How many ain't going to vote at all? So what I'm talking about is you have to understand how to have a broad strategy, a micro strategy. And when I keep saying elections are on the margins, that was what Virginia, who is now the Virginia Speaker of the House, Don Scott said, where he told folks, they said, I don't understand why you're bringing Roland Martin in to do his show. He said, because we're going to win on the margins. He said two, three, four hundred votes can make the difference between us gaining the House or, or, not, or, or Republicans controlling it. And that's how they won because he understood the margins. And that to me is what the, all these groups who are gonna spend 2022, $9 billion was the total amount spent on the 2022 election. It'll exceed 10 billion easy this year. They better understand margins and they better understand that you can't run a campaign in 2024 that you ran in 2020 or 2016 because the voter is totally different. That person who was 12 in 2016, that person now is 20. Yeah, and they can't uh, take for granted, Democrats can't take for granted that just because uh, your, their parents voted for Democrats or have historically voted for Democrats or their grandmother doesn't want them to vote for anybody other than a Democrat, that that's exactly what they're going to do. So that's exactly what targeting is. You're shooting at a target, but there has to be a reason as well, right? If you go and decide that you're going to blanket something and do it everywhere, uh, then now uh, uh, that's fine, except if the people that you need to draw out are in this small, more focused uh, group, then and you have a way to target them directly, that's something that you're supposed to do. Well, it'd be, it'd be crazy. It would be like my friend here, uh, Pete Aguilar, doing something for uh, all of Los Angeles to reach this targeted audience in the Inland Empire. Your choices are you either do something super targeted or you go L.A. where people can't vote for you. So you have to be focused about what it is that you need to do. You understand you need to do. And data is everything. There is publicly available data that lets you know precisely who to target, where the votes are, how people voted for you before, who didn't, who did, why, et cetera. Take that information, process it, and now you can be targeted and focused about who you want and why, knowing precisely how many votes you need, where they're going to come from. That's going to give you a much better shot. And, you know, There's no points for shooting with, while blindfolded. OK, uh, because you really could miss and there's a better chance that you do miss, particularly when the blinds can come off and you have data that lets you know exactly where to shoot. When COVID happened, 
Poor people were dying at a rate already of 800 people a day before COVID. If you went to a funeral every single day, it would take you 600 years to attend all the funerals of the people who will die from the ravages of policy violence, poverty, and low wages in America in just one year. It would take you two years and 19 days to go to all of the funerals of the people that will die today, and oftentimes, silence. Nobody talks about this political genocide, but we are determined today to remember their death and be a resurrection of voting power and voice power like never before. Economic justice and saving this democracy are deeply connected. We, as a nation, must listen to the demands of the poor who are pushing and will continue to push political candidates and elected leaders to lift from the bottom so that everybody can rise. We are the poor, the marginalized, and the underpaid. And we are taking one step forward to say that everybody has a right to live. Poverty is not the fault of those who are impoverished. It is caused by those who make the policy. There are over 135 million poor and low-wage, low-income people in this nation. The biggest block of potential voters by far is low-income, low-wage voters. I can't afford medicine. Sometimes I have to skip because of the cost. The farm worker community is tired of the violence imposed upon us by greed, exclusion, and denial of basic human rights. Those folk that represented by that casket, poor and low-wage workers who are the most moral people in this country because they go to work every day believing, even though going to work is hazardous to their health. I'm tired of working 70 to 80 hours a week and still not have money for the necessity of bills. I'm tired of getting sick and not being able to go see the doctor. Having to make a choice to pay between rent or the light bill or food or clothes. You cannot claim to care about families and a culture of life and then do everything in your power to rob people of equal access to resources and to force them to live in poverty. Leadership of both parties that waged war on poor people and low wage workers. And this government has treated people experiencing poverty, including their military families, with disdainful, deliberate, malicious neglect. So the truth is that my son died from poverty. We refuse to accept poverty as the fourth leading cause of death. The fourth leading cause of death in this, the richest country in the world. We march today for our children and the generations to come. And we need to do it with the loudest voices possible, the biggest actions possible. We will voice our demands and register our vote. When we stand up and when we stand together, things change. Right. There is the electorate that is, and then there is the electorate that should be. 34 million eligible poor and low income voters did not vote in 2016. If just 20% of those voters in swing states were mobilized around an agenda, they could change the political outcome of every election. So we're launching the most massive voter mobilization and turnout campaign in history of poor and low wage voters, allies, and religious leaders. People are dying, but we know it doesn't have to be this way. And so we are calling on everyone to join us in this Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. We are here, we will be seen, we will be heard, and our power will be felt. We don't need to be an insurrection. We are a resurrection that will be felt across this country. Are you ready? 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 We are a resurrection, and we are ready. And we